So um, let's start categorizing neurotransmitters. Um, the first way that they're categorized is by their chemistry, which is always annoying to students, but you'll kind of understand why that is when you see that um, if the chemistry is similar between two neurotransmitters, so then sometimes they'll share a breakdown method, sometimes the same drug will interact with their receptors. So while I don't expect you to memorize the chemical structure of any of the neurotransmitters, you need to understand um, how the chemistry impacts the potential for pharmacology. So let's talk about the categories first. Um, so the categories are in table 8.1. The first is um, the choline derivatives. Um, we're only going to learn one of those, and that's acetylcholine. And we've already been talking about acetylcholine because it's active in the somatic nervous system. It's also active in the autonomic nervous system. Then we have this category called the biogenic amines. Um, the biogenic amines are um, about the same size and shape as an amino acid, but they've changed it just a little bit. I'll show you what I mean by that. So you take an amino acid like tyrosine and you slap a hydroxyl group on it or a methyl group or something. So it's about the same size and shape as the original um, amino acid, but um, slightly different. Um, and then um, the amino acids, these are straight amino acids. They could just as easily have been part of a protein but they are actually used as a neurotransmitter. And then there are the purines. Um, so remember um, when you learn DNA structure, purines and pyrimidines. So the A's in the AT base pair, um, adenosine, that's a purine, but so is adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates on it, and adenosine triphosphate, three phosphates on it. So ATP is sometimes used as a neurotransmitter. And then there's a whole bunch of neuropeptides. We don't talk about all of them. And then there's just some weird molecules that don't seem like they would be a neurotransmitter at all, but are. Okay, so let's start talking about the first set, which are the choline derivatives. And really that's just acetylcholine. This uh, acetylcholine, um, looks like this. It's an acetic acid with um, choline. Um, choline is a water-soluble B vitamin, and you stick acetic acid on it, and you've got acetylcholine. This is the first neurotransmitter that we found. It's also the best understood. It's really abundant in the peripheral nervous system, which makes it way easier to study than a CNS neurotransmitter. So um, as far as the terminology goes with this one, this whole thing is a synapse that is using acetylcholine. This one's releasing it, this one's responding it to it, this is breaking it down, this is reuptaking it. So what's the fastest way to say that? So we talked about that before. The fastest way to say this whole business has to do with acetylcholine is to say that this is cholinergic. This whole synapse is cholinergic. It's a cholinergic receptor. So the receptor types for acetylcholine, there are two. Um, this is only showing one, but there are nicotinic cholinergic receptors and muscarinic cholinergic receptors. We'll talk about those a little bit more in the future, but nicotinic cholinergic receptors were named that because they not only bind acetylcholine, they also bind nicotine. And muscarinic cholinergic receptors were named that because they not only bind um, uh, acetylcholine, they also bind a mushroom poison called muscarine. Um, so functions of acetylcholine, big picture functionality of acetylcholine. It is usually an excitatory neurotransmitter, meaning that most often it binds to excitatory receptors. And it has both P and S functions that you've already learned. For instance, it's the most common neurotransmitter in the peripheral nervous system. All somatic motor neurons release acetylcholine. That's how that works. Um, and then, of course, in the autonomic nervous system, all of the preganglionic neurons release acetylcholine. And the postganglionic ones, um, the um, parasympathetic nervous system neurons release it again. So you knew that already. Um, and then in the C and S, so this is not P and S function, but C and S acetylcholine function, um, short-term memory and learning. Um, so it helps with short-term memory and learning. Um, and removal mechanism, the most common removal mechanism for acetylcholine is the one that you already learned with the somatic nervous system. 
generally, and there are exceptions to this, there is on the postsynaptic cell membrane an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. And acetylcholine esterase will break down acetylcholine into acetic acid and choline. And then it's going to reuptake the part that is hard to get, which is that B vitamin derivative. So it will reuptake choline, slap an acetic acid on it, recycle it, and make more acetylcholine. So it's kind of a combination of the breakdown. Breakdown alone will stop it activating the receptor, but then you will reuptake the heart, the part that is sort of your limiting factor. So um, that's the usual re, um, removal mechanism. So a couple of clinical connections about this. Um, so nicotine, um, which of course is found um, in tobacco, but not exclusively in tobacco, Nicotine is an acetylcholine agonist, meaning it mimics the activity of acetylcholine. And part of the reason that people like nicotine is because it mimics this CNS function initially. And so you feel like you've got more mental acuity, more sure you're like more with it in the early stages. Um, later on, of course, if you continue to take in large quantities of nicotine, you will cause a downregulation of your receptors and you don't feel the initial thing that made it attack attractive to you. Curare is that poison that we've talked about before that um, is um, derived, it's a plant derivative and was used in blow darts and things like that. Um, that is an acetylcholine antagonist, and so it can cause, for instance, paralysis in skeletal muscle. Um, and then Alzheimer's disease, there's a portion of the brain um, that um, uses acetylcholine for short-term memory formation. And one of the things that happens in Alzheimer's, not the only thing that happens in Alzheimer's, is that portion of the brain um, loses about 90% of the acetylcholine that it would have in a healthy person. So all of those are clinical connections related to acetylcholine. Okay.